Okay, we should probably get started. So, for those of you who were not at, at the previous session, welcome. Um, again, I, I'm Rob Johnston, the director of the George Perkins Marsh Institute here at Clark. Um, and welcome to our second panel of the day. So our, our first panel that, that we had a, a little bit ago um, was focused mainly on the past, thinking about the legacy of Roger Casperson. And this panel is designed to, to segue off that and to look into the future. What's next? Um, so specifically, um, I've asked uh, the panelists to think about the future of engaged research on risks, hazards, and sustainability science. And I, we purposely gathered a panel with, with fairly different purviews, areas of expertise to speak to this topic. Um, and I would, from a, a personal perspective and from a Clark perspective, I, mean, I think this is a particular to the time and the topic as, as we at Clark are, are really thinking about how we can move forward um, for the next one, three, ten years working in areas related to climate, environment, and social change. So, with that, we're going to run the panel very much as we did the last one. I'm going to introduce all of our panelists, and then we'll, we'll uh, go one by one. And I've asked each of our panelists to speak for about 10 minutes, and then we can open it up any remaining time for questions and answers. So. Uh, do you want to put up the, the oh. slide as Yeah, yeah, I'm not sure what, what happened there. Yeah, so, OK, there we go. Sorry, technical glitch. What, you, you didn't, Susie, you didn't want them to see all your slides through the whole thing? Yes, sir. <laughs> Sorry about that, my error. <laughs> Your slides are kind of small. Sorry. Okay. Uh, Bonnie Ram is Senior Researcher and Associate Director of the Center for Research in Wind at the University of Delaware and Director of Ram Consultancy. For 10 years, she was Strategic Advisor to the Department of Energy, Wind Technology, or sorry, the the Department of Energy Wind Technology Office and National Renewable Energy Lab, and most recently, a guest senior researcher at the Danish Technical University Wind Engineering Department. Her research focuses on the low carbon transitions of the electricity sectors in different countries with an emphasis on offshore and land-based wind energy siting strategies and decision, decision science, local stakeholder engagement strategies, and environmental risks and benefits analysis. Seth Tuller is an associate professor in the Department of Integrative and Global Studies at Worcester Polytechnic Institute, WPI, just down the street. He received his PhD in Environmental Science and Policy from Clark in 1996. Seth's research interests have been concerned with risk governance, public participation, long-term stewardships of contaminated sites, and developing tools to characterize human impacts and vulnerabilities of risk to risk events. He's on the board of directors of the Social and Environmental Research Institute. He's also served as a member of three National Academies of Sciences committees on the transportation of nuclear waste in the destruction of the US chemical and the destruction of the US chemical weapons stockpile. Ed Carr is professor and director of IDCE, International Development Community and Environment here at Clark. He has worked as a policy advisor and scientific advisor in development donors and multilateral organizations such as the US, USAID, the US Agency for International Development, and the World Bank, and is currently a panel member for climate change adaptation on the scientific and technical advisory panel of the Global Environment Facility, GEF. Carr has served as a lead author of four global environmental assessments, including the Working Group 2 contribution to the sixth assessment report of the IPCC. Tony Bebbington is International Director of the Natural Resources and Climate Change Program at the Ford Foundation, having previously served at Clark University and as Director of the Graduate School of Geography and Milton P. and Alice C. Higgins Professor of Environment and Society. Say that a few times. <laughs> Where he is currently um, on leave of absence and we are trying to get him back. <laughs> He is a member of the U.S. National Academy of Sciences and the American Academy of Arts and Sciences and has been a Guggenheim Foundation Fellow, an Australian Research Council Laureate Fellow, an Economic and Social Research Council Profession, Professorial Fellow, and a lot of other things. 
<laughs> Bevington held earlier positions at the University of Manchester, Cambridge, and Colorado, as well as the World Bank, Overseas Development Institute, and the In International Institute for Environment and Development. And his work focuses on extractive industries, natural resource governance, territorially based development, and civil society organizations. <laughs> and finally, last but not least, Suzanne C. Moser, Susie Moser, is an independent scholar and consultant who works in the U.S. and internationally from a base in western Massachusetts, the unceded ancestral homeland of the Nipmuc and, how am I going to say that again? Pocumtuck. Pocumtuck, thank you. A geography by training, Ph.D. in 1997, here from Clark, her work over the past 30 years has focused on adaptation to climate change, climate change communication, science policy interactions, and psychosocial resilience in the face of traumatic and transformative challenges associated with climate change. She served on scientific advisory boards for Future Earth, the International Science Council, the U.S. National Research Council, and contributed to IPCC and U.S. National Climate Assessments. And um, if you want to learn more, she's got her own website, <laughs> which you can look up at SuzanneMoser.com. Um, and with that, I'm going to turn over, um, turn the floor over to our panel. Again, we're going to start with Bonnie, Seth, Ed, Tony, and then Susie's going to bring us home. Thank you. Thank you, Rob. Um, well, I'm going to read a little bit um, and uh, just say that my story with Roger is a bit different than the other panelists. Um, I was never a graduate student. Uh, of his or an academic colleague. Uh, but when I was a graduate student here at Clark, uh, I was working under, some of you may remember, Harry Schwartz um, and David Major. And I was the, one of the first, since I'm ancient, uh, one of the first um, students in the Environmental Affairs five-year program. So I later collaborated, um, because I needed a job, with the Marxist geographers, and they were housed at Sented. Um, some of you have already heard about Scented, um, and ro that Roger was leading at the time. And there were not many of us in the gym. Some of you that were in Scented are here today, so that's really gratifying. Um, and we all knew one another, and we were in our separate pods in the 1980s, um, but there was a terrific spirit of collaboration, uh, intellectual curiosity, um, multiple scientific theories and personalities. Um, but it was a great culture, and um, I still remember it like it was yesterday. Um, we believed we were working on hard problems, the human environment interfaces, contributing to a better world. Um, I was not aware at the time what everybody at Centen was addressing, but we knew Roger was focusing on complex decisions around technologies and global environmental change before we called it climate change. Um, complex decisions and really an emphasis on stakeholder engagement is the former panelists were talking about. Also, I wanted to recollect that we were freezing in the gym all the time because it was not supposed to be office spaces. And Ellen and Paul hughes Cromick will attest to that, who are here. Uh, be, and that perhaps generated very warm and, uh, feelings and creativity as well. It was a fantastic environment to be in as a 20-something. And then I went off to Zimbabwe, and I worked with the Stockholm-based Bayer Institute with Phil O'Keefe and Gordon Goodman, which is another six degrees of separation with Roger. Um, and um, then uh, there were very deep Clark threads all throughout my professional life. So fast forward 20 years later, and I'm working in Washington uh, with the DOE Wind Technology Center um, office, sorry, leading in the environmental analysis program and working with stakeholders across the country. Um, and writing national strategy documents and having the time of my life. Um, and we were working on landscape impacts and effects to species, mostly birds, as most of you know, that's what you think of when you think of wind energy, and impacts to communities um, hosting wind. At that time, there, was significant, there weren't a significant number of wind turbines that were deployed. And in, 20, in 2003, my mentor of the Wind Technology Center, Bob Thresher, uh, held an urgent meeting, said there was an unexpected incident at a new wind energy site in Pennsylvania, and there were dozens of bat species that were killed, and it was hitting the media. 
And I said surprise because we had been working on these issues for a long time, but mostly focused on birds and other species. And we had no idea that there was a problem with um, migratory bats. So we immediately formed the Bat and Wind Energy Cooperative. And that was with comprised of regulatory agencies, wind developers, of course, bat biologists. And I know there's a, there's a biologist in the room, so please forgive me for being a little bit off putting on the biologist um, <laughs> later in my talk. After about a year of this collaborative, um, but we knew the biologists were driving the research agenda because you know we were all worried, you know, this is a green technology, now it's killing another species, how are we going to handle that? Um, and they were pretty much asking two basic questions. Why were the bats attracted to wind turbines? And in what type of ecological setting? And then what was the state of the art of methods and technologies that we understood better why bats were attracted to turbines and being struck and then killed. And that was about it. So I was facilitating this group with the National Renewable Energy Lab, and we were, you know, kind of, you know, the bat biologists getting a lot of funding, and we were trying to move forward with what's the numbers even. We had no idea. But I had this nagging feeling that we weren't really getting anywhere except how to better count the dead bat. And I thought, gee, I had spent 20 years in the environmental field, and this didn't seem like where I wanted to live. Um, so we started to think about, you know, what are we going to do, um, except are we just going to count them better? We need a multidisciplinary train, you know, approach to this, and how are we going to get there? I was working with engineers and bat biologists. So that was where I sat, and so I started talking to um, Bob, and I thought, you know, we need to talk to somebody that has a big vision, somebody that's working on climate, somebody that understands the energy transition, multi-dimensional complex problems. We're not asking the right questions. And I immediately thought about Roger, and I thought, well, I'm just going to call Roger up. What the heck, right? And so I knew he was back from Sweden, and I dialed the Clark number, never sent him an email, didn't do any introduction, and I call Roger, and I said, Roger, how are you? Remember me? I'm calling you about dead bats. And he started <laughs> laughing, and I said, no, this is serious. I'm not making that up. Um, and um, I said, you know, I have a situation. I explained the situation, and he immediately said three questions. You know, he started asking, like, totally different questions. I said, you know, we have to figure something out. And this gets to the themes you guys were talking about. You know, like he just went right for the jugular on the, these things. He said, well, are you comparing these wind technology and the risks to the bats to other environmental and human risks? And I thought, risks? What's that? And where are they facing different problems? How are you determining whether the numbers that you are finding are significant? And I thought, oh, I don't know. Um, you're working with decision makers on climate and deployment. You're not working with conservation of bats. Why aren't you thinking of how you're going to frame the question of the numbers? I'm like, oh, that's a really good point. We don't have a framework for determining the significance of the risk. And what about other communities, he said. Do they care? I said, what other communities? We're working with regulators and developers. He's like, no, the communities around the host sites, the wind technology sites. Oh, we don't... I said, we just care about the bat behaviors, not the people. <laughs> he said, that's a problem. And then, what about the risk perceptions of these stakeholders? I said, risk perceptions, that could affect how decision, decision makers view whether you killed 50 bats, but you've got 50 million. Who the heck cares? I said, we can't say that to the bat biologists. He said, yes, you can. <laughs> and then we thought, oh my gosh, what about, he said, have you looked at other siting strategies for other technologies? I said, what other technology? Other energy technologies? I said, no. We start from a blank sheet of paper in the wind technology office. So that pretty much blew up our whole scientific <laughs> agenda with a do new direction. So 20 years later, after that happened, um, the Bat and Wind Energy Cooperative still exists. I moved on from the bats and birds, and I'm still challenged by some of those original questions that Roger posed, because they never went to the multidimensional complex approaches. They only dealt with the bat biologists, so they are still counting dead bat carcasses and trying to understand whether or not that's significant. 
So when I look back around um, you know, these important insights about the clean energy transition and the legacy at Clark that he started and what we learned at CENTED, all of those poignant questions are still relevant and I'm still working on them um, 20 years later. And what were they came down to is the application of comparative risk analysis is essential for understanding public values and the politics around environmental risks and it informs risk acceptability and influences uncertainty more than data collection, which was a huge um, different perspective from what we were doing at the Department of Energy. The second thing is that the low carbon energy transition involves more than a technology and fuel switch from fossils. It requires institutional, social, cultural changes and more integrated human environment systems, which of course you've been hearing about all morning. And that's gonna better equip, up, equip us to address these seemingly intractable risk conundrums of the clean energy transition. And finally, risk benefit perceptions are at the core of understanding and communicating with stakeholders and other affected parties. So we need a new strategy still focused on highlighting the very positive social, political, environmental, and economic benefits of the clean energy transition. So those thorny questions um, and Roger's inspiration led me to totally change my focus in the wind energy area, not to mention my personal life. And I do not work on bat mortality and environmental risk very much anymore, but on community engagement, social acceptability, but, and how to more effectively communicate risks and benefits to local citizens and regional public officials. Um, and so the importance of posing these multi-dimensional provocative questions are still in my brain and we're still trying to work on that. Um, and uh, that also led us to publish seven articles and chapters, which of course Roger is also an expert at getting kindred spirits to participate um, in these thorny questions, and um, that has led me to collaborate with several of Roger's graduate students sitting on the panel and in the audience, um, and thank you very much for being here. Thanks, Rob, and thanks to the Department of Geography for inviting me here. Um, I usually hate reunions, um, but this has been really cool. I've been, like two hours that I've here and all these people that I get to see, so this is <laughs> I'm really gratified to be here. Um, I started working um, with Roger in 1987 as a researcher at Sented and used to commute back and forth from Boston with Sam all the time. Um, uh, I think. Roger and his colleagues at CENTED, um, as well as his many close collaborators, which you've been hearing about, both inside of Clark and outside of Clark, were leaders in the social studies of risk. Um, and uh, just at Clark, just to name a few of them, um, there was Rob Goebel, Chris Honemser, Alina Brown, Ortwin Wren, Dale Haddis, Sam, um, Alan White, who was here for a little bit, Jody Emmel, Jean, of course, and um, and also Mimi Barbarian, who um, um, played a big role in, his, in the work. Um, there's probably others that I'm missing. But I think um, they, they had a commitment to um, interdisciplinary research and systems thinking. Um, and their contributions were really, in many ways, um, an effort to broaden the understanding of risk to include many social dimensions of what people care about and experience from hazards. And I, I feel like I'm going to say a lot of the same things that you've been hearing all morning. Um, uh, and so Roger's work on risk and hazards were also driven by, among his colleagues too, as a, a strong commitment to democratic decision making, um, linking theory and practice, justice and, and equity. Um, and he thought about um, a lot about that what the non-experts um, people think matters, um, people in their communities or people at work. Um, and at its social policy and the political failure to base decisions on just what um, the experts think. So it's really about the social dimensions of risk. Um, and, and I'm thinking about um, what are the future directions. Um, I thought about kind of two broad points. One is um, what are the questions that 
he and others had been working on um, and thinking about that still matter um, and that are still relevant. And then maybe a little bit about how the world has changed in the last 20 so years and, um, and that there's new challenges. But I think listening this morning, the more I'm thinking about it is um, <clears throat> maybe what's really needed is to help the rest of the world catch up to what the work has been done here at, um, at Clark. Um, and that may be um, really be thinking about um, questions about institutions and, and other entities and how they learn from and adopt the kinds of um, insights that have been developed here. Um, so there's a lot of topics to choose from. Um, I'm gonna just briefly touch on um, the risk communication, the siting of hazardous facilities, and the social amplification of, amplification of risk framework. Um, so risk communication was, and it still is, um, sometimes conceived as how to educate ignorant people about what the real risk is. Um, and Sam, you know, gave a good example of that. Um, so instead of addressing the concerns of uh, people who are at risk, how they, you know, what they experience or how they feel, it was about experts telling people how they should feel. Um, um, there was work done here about the role of trust and, um, um, <clears throat> In a sort of in a cynical way, the role of trust is trying to get the confidence of people so that um, they could do the experts or um, government agencies, regulators could do what they saw fit. Um, and these are a little bit caricatures, but they're really not far off from what um, they were experiencing um, and uh, in New York and in other places, um, especially when it came to things about nuclear and other kinds of hazardous processes and facilities. Um, um, so, Roger and the colleagues here, they, I think they, they really reacted with questions about, um, for example, where do hazards emerge from? Whose knowledge counts? How stakeholders ought to be involved in decision making and management? The questionable privileges that are claimed by experts and the implications of the, um, them making those claims. Um, they inquired about why some hazards and risks and their consequences get attention and others do not. Um, they thought about complexities. Um, and, you know, I, I jotted down one, uh, I jotted it down, I typed it, and I'm also remembering how Roger almost never typed anything. It was always, everything was written in little arrows and places and scratches. And, um, anyways, um, so uh, one thing that's a theme of the work is about openness and, and, and public participation and how that may be a mechanism for uh, enhancing social trust, but it also can reveal problems and uncertainties that undermine how people think about the competence of institutions. Um, so learning is promoted by thorough assessments of failures and surprises, but those can also undermine confidence and trust. So when analyses and issues are evolving, um, what's the recommendation for agencies or institutions is do you communicate about them even if you run the risk of being wrong or do you wait for things to become more clear? And it's kind of a tightrope to walk. And one of, I think, the um, important questions that um, to continue to work on is where's the balance and what's the balance in different contexts? Um, so a lot of the work um, kind of culminated um, with the articulation of the social amplification of risk framework in 1988. And Bonnie mentioned the special issue. And, um, and there's really continued work on that. Um, so I, I bring these up about. Um, uh, really, I guess it, the point that I wanted to try to make here is, and I'm doing it very quickly, is that they, that work raised many questions and, um, and we're still trying to understand how to answer them and how to bring that kind of knowledge to, to practice. Um, we sort of see in, um, in a lot of contexts that some things are better, right? I mean, public participation and risk decision-making is more prevalent. You hear more about equity and the distribution of risks and benefits. The Department of Energy and its Office of Nuclear uh, Energy uh, is adopting a consent-based process for identifying communities that would um, host uh, um, nuclear waste um, disposal sites. And uh, one of Roger's favorite, um, I'd say favorite, but um, areas of grumpiness um, was about the number of social scientists that are actually working in some of these agencies. And also the Office of Nuclear Policy, Nuclear Power, is um, 
they've hired a whole bunch of uh, social scientists um, recently. But I think it's really hard to argue that that change is deep and systemic. Um, and as an example, Tom Webler, who is also a, an alum here, we're finishing a paper that's reviewing the literature on the siting of small modular nuclear reactors. So there's a big push to um, kind of revive the nuclear industry by bringing small reactors to cities and more remote communities. Because um, the argument goes they're, they're just inherently safe and they're low carbon energy source. So in that literature we found just virtually no consideration of the question of community or social acceptance of the, either specific projects or the technology. And there's no reference except in passing to the vast literature on siting of hazardous facilities. Um, questions about social acceptance are also still relevant in the context of um, new renewable energy systems, wind and solar, and the changes that urgent decarbonization will require. So we, we knew siting of hazardous facilities is a challenge, and now we're faced with controversies about, um, about wind and solar. So this was a surprise to many. It was not at all a surprise to Roger. Um, uh, but it raises questions about that idea of democratic decision making and um, um, perceptions of risk and planning. And so what, did, what do we do about the urgent need to cut carbon emissions um, uh, while inclusive decision making might offer opportunities to ensure energy and social justice? What happens when no community agrees to have wind or solar systems? Um, we know top-down approaches may just exacerbate problems even though they might help with siting, um, but they could lead to more social distrust, unfair distribution of risk and environmental injustice, economic inefficiencies, and, and social conflict. So I ask, what are the tools and understandings from the field of risk and hazards that can contribute to these old questions about siting of new facilities? Um, last couple thoughts is that institutionally, we haven't really moved beyond planning that's pretty siloed, and so much effort's been devoted to think, well, work on comparative assessment of risks pointed to the many social and organizational factors that focus people's attention on different risks and not others. Um, but that, that I don't, it hasn't really brought into the institutions that think about planning. So just think about energy planning. So what are the relative risks of importing large-scale hydroelectricity from Quebec versus utility-scale solar systems and that are built on forest lands um, or farms in southern New England um, and offshore wind facilities. You know, what are the trade-offs in carbon emissions or the consequences for food systems um, equity or equity across regions and across the options? And these questions are, are rarely asked in a comparative sense in planning agencies or by advocates or opponents on, uh, for different sources of energy. Um, so the, that's sort of uh, the f first point, point I was trying to make is in some of these examples is there's all these questions, again, that we can still be working on. I think also there's ways that um, the world has changed some in the last 20 years. Um, when a lot of this work was initially being done, there wasn't much of an internet or there was no internet. Um, there's social media, there's globalization and um, strong, more tightly connected systems. <clears throat> perhaps the speed of environmental change. Tom and I were talking on the car on the way here and we sort of thought about rogue individuals that, um, that sort of the wealth gap um, and that there's a certain set of individuals in the world that are able to, in a sense, do their own experiments um, or propose them that could have global consequences. So, um, you know, Back in the 80s and 90s, there was the work on trust that was being done here. Um, and we thought trust in institutions was really bad then. Um, it's worse now. Um, and it's not just distrust in, or lack of confidence in experts in risk management institutions, but also just in science, generally. There also seems to be more polarization and kind of an either or thinking. And it seems harder to have meaningful discussions. And I'm reminded of um, uh, time, 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 done time. For like a minute of time, okay. Um, okay, so just quickly that, you know, there was a study and Americans tend to um, uh, talk a lot about politics um, compared to um, uh, people in Europe, for example, that they tend to talk to people they agree with, whereas in Europe, people tend to talk more with people that they agree with and that they disagree with. 
Um, so it's easy to blame social media about this, and there's, there's, I'm sure there's lots of other factors that come into play, but I think um, um, areas for advancing work would be in the social amplification of risk framework, and there are people who have been thinking about social media and how that matters. I think we don't have a real good handle on it, and we should continue to do that. Um, Rob Goble, um, Tom, and myself have been thinking about um, what uh, social amplification of risk framework 2.0 might look like, and we're going to be trying to pull people together from the old cast of characters and new people who will be really interested in this. So I'll stop there, I guess. All right. Thank you. So, so I think this is going to actually work out really well because I think I'm going to pick up a bunch of themes that uh, you just heard. And I, I want to approach this sort of question on the future for engaged research um, through the lens of global assessments. And I, I want to do that because I think of them as one of several levers for change in the world uh, that at least I engage with and that notion of levers for change sort of animates basically everything I do professionally. So I think these are really important. And Clark and Clarkese uh, have been formative in global assessments. I think that is reasonably well known and uh, a point of, that to picks up from what you just heard from Seth. Um, geographers are now central to a lot of these assessments. Uh, working Group 2, the IPCC, is dominated by geographers at this point. That was definitely not true 20 years ago, but it is now. Uh, I'm not sure to what extent Clarkese can take the credit and or blame for that, but there's definitely uh, a, ch a shift that has gone on. But I, when you think about assessment and you think about Clark, I mean, remember, Earth has transformed. That whole effort was itself an assessment at the same time as the first assessment report of the IPCC. We think of these things as common now, but that was something very new at the time. And of course, Billy Turner was part of that, Bob Cates. But if you look across the assessment, this is, by the way, a completely incomplete list, right? If you look at the IPCC, the Millennium Ecosystem Assessment, you had Tom Downing, you had Kirsten Dow as parts of those things. You look at IPBES, you heard about from Rinku uh, yesterday talking about, she mentioned Emma Archer. But also, this is not just people who are currently faculty or folks who were like alums from a long time ago. Mario Machado, who just graduated recently his PhD, is one of the fellows of the IPBES Nexus assessment. So that next generation of people working on this is coming out of Clark uh, as well. And even if we think past environmental stuff, sitting next to me, Tony has worked on things like the World Development Reports, which are also uh, a form of assessment. So now I'm going to offer what I believe will sound like a Casperson-esque provocation, which is, where is this all going? We're grinding out assessment after assessment after assessment. By the way, I'm at least as guilty of this as anybody, right? I like, keep writing these things. Um, and we do get better each assessment. And I'll give an example of what that's like, and it ties into things people are talking about. The changing framing of vulnerability in, for example, the IPCC's assessments, right? If you back up you'll see this very exposure first framing of vulnerability, right? What is the hazard that's gonna come get us? What do we protect? There's no discussion of the thing being protected and whether or not we ought to protect it. It's just this thing coming to get us. And over time, that has morphed into a real attention to the underlying structures of vulnerability and then how climate change lands on those, amplifies, impacts them, and creates really differentiated outcomes for people. And that doesn't happen without work like, as we've heard about, the social amplification of risk. That doesn't happen without work, like we heard about yesterday from, for example, Diane, on feminist political ecology. The kinds of stuff that really highlights whose risk, whose vulnerability, is actually at stake here. And that, of course, pulls forward the conversations around justice and equity that I think have been lurking here for a very long time, but pulls it into a really different policy arena. And, and the most recent uh, AR for uh, Working Group 2 kind of fully embraced that take on vulnerability, which is a really significant departure. At the same time, I would argue that the marginal value of a new assessment has been dropping for some time. Um, the impact has been, and I would argue continues to be, uh, largely limited to a couple of news cycles. Uh, as someone who's advised a presidential appointee at USAID, and I helped write USAID's first climate change strategy, policymakers don't read the summary for policymakers. <laughs> Their staffs don't read the summary for policymakers. What you get is a reverse justification of what the institutions were going to do anyway selectively pulling from the summary for policymakers when they find that useful. 
That's not as true, by the way, in multilaterals. It's a little bit different there. But all the bilaterals, that's definitely what's happening. Um, there has been a shift going on over time, but I would point to that first issue as kind of a big challenge of what assessments do and what impact they have. Um, but there's also another one going on, which is there has been a shift in the Biden administration. The Biden administration, interestingly, has taken on this real linking of climate vulnerability and justice very, very seriously. And they are actually putting people in every federal agency to make them work on this particular agenda. But implementation is an absolute circus right now because no one knows how to do it. I got a phone call last summer from US, US DOT, Department of Transportation's Volpe Center, asking if I could give a talk on climate, climate change and justice. And I'm like, you guys know I don't know anything about transportation, right? I, I did a place that had a road in it. I, I worked there, but I don't know how any of this works. And they're like, no, no, we don't care about that. We just don't understand how to link those two things together. And so you see these federal agencies desperately trying to catch up to this changing mandate, but you know, the staffing, the structures, all that stuff hasn't caught up yet. So we have these assessments that are telling people things that they don't know how to implement or necessarily do much with. All right, so then what are we going to do? I'm going to provoke. I'm going to at least try to go somewhere with it. And what role might Clark and might GSG play? This is the where do we go next thing. I'm going to make an argument for engagement, which has been a theme that's come up several times across the last couple of days. While independence, I think, is a critical component of any kind of assessment, um, you have to recognize that most of these assessments have links to institutions that are formalized. So, for example, the IPCC, most of you know, right, the Summary for Policymakers is actually negotiated with the member governments. And some people see this as a real problem, a perversion of science or something along those lines. But you have to remember what the IPCC is for. Principally, the IPCC's job is to provide the factual basis against which all climate negotiations take place. So if all the countries do not agree to this as a shared set of facts, you have done nothing with this assessment in its primary purpose. So you have to sort of understand how this is all going to work. And what that means is that you actually have to think about who's using it, what it gets used for. This also means that independence is not the same thing as disengagement from these sorts of organizations. If we're operating in completely parallel universes, in our research, in our assessments, and that sort of thing, as opposed to the people who are supposed to take that on and work with it in the world, we are writing for other people who do assessments. We are not writing for the audiences that might use these assessments. Uh, put super bluntly, if writing a reference article is your path to impact, you may not be having much impact. Um, for, I'll give you an example of this problem that starts to kick up when we have sort of parallel processes. Uh, there's a scale problem in the IPCC right now that I would argue is there that became really clear to me over the last nine months or so because I've been leading a report for the Board for International Food and Agricultural Development, which advises USAID on what they should be spending their food security money on under climate change. And one of the things we're trying to identify is what is climate change going to do to agricultural production in different parts of the world? Well, if you go to the IPCC and you go to, for example, the Working Group 2 chapter, which is chapter 5, um, on this topic, you have a fantastic chapter that captures what we understand scaled to the global. So talk about percentages of lost production, that kind of thing, almost all pegged to the global. No policy happens at the global. At best, policy happens at the national, often happens subnational, and there is almost nothing in that assessment report that would guide policy down at that level. So there's a real question about then, what are we going to do with that data? It's not implementable at this point. And I think that makes it kind of clear where engagement, understanding of audience, what we think things are supposed to do becomes really, really important for our practice. I will say that I do see an ongoing pivot in this community right now. Um, at best, the transformational change assessment I'm actually part of right now uh, has a working group that is trying to engage policymakers, decision makers, right now before we've even written the first order draft, let alone before the review and approval processes, in an effort to try to figure out how we can frame this thing so that someone could actually pick it up and do something with it, as opposed to what we think we ought to be writing for everyone else. Um, it seems really appropriate to be talking about engagement here, especially after a panel on Roger Casperson's legacy here, but also, I think, just broadly, you know, Clark's legacy. 
Um, you know, there have been loads of National Academies panels convened by various Clark faculty, Clark alums, that sort of thing. And of course, remember, National Academies panels typically have a client somewhere that asked for that thing. So you're doing work that actually reaches into these organizations. Tony's been at the World Bank, now at Ford. Uh, Kirsten spent time at the Stockholm Environment Institute. And these, again, are just some of the people here. But I think it's really, really critical to take this work incredibly seriously. And this builds on what we heard from Kendra McSweeney the other day. Um, this engagement is as much about us influencing other people, it's about us understanding the people that we think we're trying to influence. Again, articles don't do it. When I first went to Washington, I had the good fortune to have a fellowship that was fairly high profile, so they could pull in uh, former and current political figures to talk to us, and there was a former Republican congressman from Oklahoma, and this is 2010, so he was moderate in 2010, so today he'd be a Democrat, I guess. Um, <laughs> but he said to all of us, I thought this was an amazing moment, because I'm sitting in this room, most of the people in the room who had this fellowship were natural scientists. And he said, the problem for you folks, that was a big collective you folks, is that in your world, when you have data and analysis and conclusions, you think you have truth. Here in Washington, you have a viewpoint. And the point is there, as much as I watched all my natural scientist colleagues like keel over in horror at, at that moment, you have to argue for the things you find. And that's some of what's been coming up here. It's not enough to just write it up. You have to advocate for it. You have to push for it in these different kinds of arenas. And that means struggling through lots of really frustrating and hard conversations. And that's going to lead to ethical questions, right? Uh, ethics of engagement and disengagement. Although I would remind everybody that disengagement is itself an ethical question, particularly if the organization is going to do what it's going to do, regardless of whether you show up. Um, so I think there are real questions of efficacy versus ethical questions. Um, and we have to be kind of careful also because when urgency becomes really important, um, that's great as a motivator, but can also be a cover for extreme and unproductive actions. So my last thought then is why Clark? Why the Graduate School of Geography? Because this kind of work is going to take some serious creativity. There is no blueprint for necessarily doing this kind of work. But what I heard just the other day, uh, and Kevin St. Martin, I'm calling you back out for this, but I thanked you for it yesterday. The sort of bricolage that Kevin described in a Clark geography graduate experience, right, where you can pull from theory, from people doing all kinds of different work and kind of cobble that together in your own way, that's the kind of stuff that we're going to need. And I think it's a compelling argument for this sort of education, which is really hard to do in most disciplinary settings. You don't get to do that kind of broad reaching thing. And so I think it's a compelling argument for nature society geography, and I think it's a compelling argument for the Graduate School of Geography. Thanks. Who would have guessed he works for IDC? <laughs> <laughs> So it's, called, oh, okay. it's what's called allyship. <laughs> um, first of all, thank you, Rob, for the invitation and for the grace with which you put this panel together, because it's always a labor of love to do things like this, so thank you. Um, and I think what I'm going to say is simply re repetition after what Bonnie, Seth, and Ed have said, but without the rich nuances. Um, but here we go. And I need to start with a few caveats. I'm not a risk hazards person. I never did a risk hazards course at Clark, so that was not part of my bricolage. Um, on arriving at the GSG as a graduate student from a very different sort of UK geography program that focused on history, abstract theory, culture, and power, and not much on the environment, I really did find it hard to understand, a bit like Billy was commenting early on, why risk work, risk work was even inside the geography department. I'm also not sure I'm a sustainability science person, or I struggle with that identity partly because I'm always uncertain about the boundaries of sustainability science, or why it's really a science as opposed to an approach to problem framing. But I do currently work, as you've heard, in a philanthropic program that focuses on inequality and natural resource justice. And I do have a long standing interest in rural development. And so those two perspectives are gonna frame these couple of thoughts, as I'm gonna, and I am gonna try and stick closely to the prompt that Rob gave us, which was, Panelists will explore the continuities and trajectories between Clark Geography's formative work on risk hazards and sustainability science in relation to contemporary work on those and related topics in and beyond the domain of adaptation and other responses to climate change. So I just want to 
track, and it's a, maybe a bit of a stretch, it's, well, these are hypotheses, not statements, um, of two possible trajectories, continuities and trajectories that involve some change, but there seem to be continuities to me that map back to Roger's contributions and the team of which Roger was a part. The first set of contrib continuities, or the first continuity, is very much inside Clark and inside the GSG. I forgot to stop my timer. Um, and the second, I, I have here in my notes less obvious, but after Bonnie and Seth, maybe not less obvious, continuity is one that I think one can argue runs from that formative period to current work on just energy transitions that's being done by, by partners that we have at the Ford Foundation. And as I speak of the continuities, I want to suggest that they, they track through a mix of ideas and concepts that travel over time, individuals, key individuals that travel with those ideas and concepts and argue for them, and institutions and institutional forms. So the first continuity, or first domain of continuity, is much more inside Clark and the GSG. I think it, it can be argued, it has been argued, that the Graduate School of Geography has simply let its storied tradition in risk hazards work slowly slip away. Since 2010, which is when I came back, um, there have been no position requests in geography and far less actual job searches that have been framed explicitly as risk hazard searches. Though the words risk and hazard may have appeared in lists of risk possible research orientations of candidates to be considered. And it's also the case that when Sam retired and when Colin Polsky left, our two most recent bona fide risk hazard people, their replacements were not framed as risk hazards replacements. So we could elaborate hypotheses for why things have gone that way, but what I want to do is move my comments in another direction and by, suggest by suggesting that if we were to view risk and hazards really as problems of inequality and injustice in some of the ways that Kirsten and Susan were commenting on in the past section, past, se past section, session, it was a section also, um, then maybe we can suggest the tradition's not been lost. Um, it's been reframed. And that's because the justice question and a more general sensibility to injustices remain central to the work at GSG and Marsh, and I think perhaps even more so than was the case in the past. Um, and many times the way in which they're framed is in terms of environment, injustice. Slightly less so in relation to technology, which is Roger's focus, but nonetheless. Um, now, I think it's a slightly sensitive path to tread to make this link, to the extent that Neither, as I understand anyway, neither Roger nor Bob were entirely comfortable with the broadly Marxist critique of the early work on risk and hazards that focused on inequalities and focused on the production of inequalities. And I wouldn't want to suggest a continuity with which Roger would not be comfortable. But my suggestion is that this broad range of social theories on which approaches to inequality and injustice inside Clark now um, stretch much wider than those initial critiques. And so I'm hoping that this is a continuity, that that continuity from thinking through from risk hazards through to contemporary folk on injustice and inequality is one that Roger would feel comfortable with. And I draw some solace from some of the comments that, and documents that Susan was referring to earlier on. And a, a bit, this is not really a continuity, but it's related to a reflection on sustainability science as a use-oriented, problem-focused application of multidisciplinary approaches to human environment problems. And what continuities we can see there at, at Clark. And I think one can argue that there is still an obvious presence of sustainability science approaches in work at Clark. Thinking of the work of, and it's always difficult when you call out names because that means you miss out names, but just, um, Tim Downs, Rinku, Ed's own work, the work at Marsh in general. Um, but I wonder if it's a, it's a slightly truncated continuity to the extent that Clark has, or we, have struggled to 
really build a powerful institutional vehicle to carry that forward. There have been stops and starts along the way. And that, I want to suggest, is what makes the ongoing discussions right now about the possible school of climate, environment, and society potentially a new opportunity to not have that institutional vehicle being truncated again. Were such a school to form, perhaps one way in which Clark could influence the future trajectory of sustainability science would be to really grapple with how, sustain with how sustainability science is problem-focused and use-oriented. For it's one thing to claim that orientation, and quite another thing to ask the hard questions about who should define these problems and who should define the understandings of usefulness that will underlie that sustainability science pursuit of knowledge. Asking the who question would also lead to having to grapple with, very hard, with the how question. How would one think about the governance of science in which plural who's would have a voice in defining what problems to work on and why they were useful? That's not a little bit echoing Ed. That's not a call to, for constraints on intellectual freedom, but it is to suggest that opening up social participation in defining what to research and why, and how to link that research to action, might spur innovations not only at Clark, but also within the community of sustainability science. And the new school could offer a venue for thinking through those issues. Now, sort of wrapping up very quickly with this, with this uh, second continuity, which is more beyond Clark. Um, and I was going to say a few things about the Bayer Institute, but I don't need to do that now because Bonnie's already touched on that heritage. But Bayer was part, or is, part of an infrastructure in Sweden, supported by the Swedish government and the Academy of Sciences there, that focuses, or focused and focuses, on questions of environment, resilience, sustainability, and climate. And along the way, that infrastructure also involved the creation in the late 80s of the Stockholm Environment Institute which, of course, Roger left Clark to go and lead. Um, and he was very instrumental in building Stockholm Environmental Institution as an institutional vehicle. This has been a powerful institutional vehicle that has deeply embodied the principles of sustainability science. And doctoral students from Clark, Kirsten Dow, Tom Downing, and others, have played important roles in that strengthening of SEI's contributions. So for me, the first step in building a continuity from Roger's work to current global debates on energy transition is to note that continuity from risk hazards work at Clark to the building of SEI as a leading institution in sustainability science. And the second step, for me, it's very personal for me, begins with a more recent PhD graduate student from Clark who's also joined the Stockholm Environment Institute a few years ago, Elisa Arendt. Now, Elisa tells me that when she interviewed for the SEI position, the director spent a large part of the interview talking about the historical links between Clark and the Stockholm Environment Institute and waxing lyrical about Roger. Um, I and mean, she really did tell me this is... Um, anyway, Elisa is based in the Stockholm Environment Institute's Columbia office where she leads a program of work um, that looks at just energy transition and the challenges that are involved in withdrawing from coal mining and coal-based energy in Colombia, Indonesia and South Africa. So it's like a deciting problem in many respects. Um, but without wanting to push the continuity too far, as I said, these are, this is a stretch and these are hypotheses, I do want to suggest that there's a link between the risk hazard sustainability science tradition and the sort of work that Elisa is leading. Energy transition is a classic sustainability science issue. It's clearly a problem-focused topic, and its centrality to dealing with climate change makes it inherently use-focused. What's less clear is whether being problem-oriented, is, is whether problem-oriented, use-focused use research on energy transition necessarily leads towards energy transitions that are socially just. And this takes me back to that earlier comment on it matters who defines the nature of the problems and the nature of usefulness, in, in this case, in energy transition research, which I think takes us back to some of those documents that Roger was involved in earlier on that we referred to in the previous session around advocacy, community participation, and who gets to have a say and a commentary on, on, on anything. So it's two-parted an argument, so there's not time to make more of an argument. But the points I want to make are that energy transition is a risk hazard and a justice problem that is being dressed, addressed, one of the leading institutions in addressing it, is an institution that Roger played an instrumental role in consolidating. And as a sustainability science topic, 
how the issue is framed as a use-oriented problem and by whom is going to matter terribly for the final future forms that energy transitions take and how far they're socially just. So I guess the hypothesis here is that these are a couple of continuities that pass through this mix of individuals, ideas, and institutions. And in this short framing, those institutions have included, and they're all ideas, individuals, and institutions with which Roger has been involved, centrally or certainly more than tangentially. They've included Marsh, Stockholm Environment Institute, the GSG, and its doctoral program. The individuals have included not just Roger, but a slew of GSG doctoral students and other students who've been playing an important role in keeping these trajectories alive. And the ideas underlying those continuities do map back in different ways to the formative ideas that Roger and his, com his, his colleagues were involved in developing back in the earlier years of the work here at Clark. Anyway, so thank you. All right, so in the spirit of adjusting your prism just a tiny bit, because we're all gonna talk about the same thing here, just through slightly different lenses, I'm gonna um, only wanna point out that I'm speaking without paper in front of me. Um, so that's the only difference really between us. But what I wanna focus on um, in this talk, uh, in this little stimulation is was you know, one of Roger's last books that he was actually, or the last book that he actually finished himself, uh, which is the uh, book on risk conundrums, and um, essentially used this to leave you with a Roger-esque kind of question, which is one of these unanswerable things that we should be thinking about for a long time. This is the book. I don't know how many of you uh, have seen it. I highly recommend it, um, because it does ask some really tough questions. What we did in the beginning in the introduction um, is to just sort of give a very rough um, history and uh, sort of snapshot of where risk analysis, risk assessment is. I'm sorry, you all have to turn around. Um, there you go. <laughs> um, but you know, the, the, the big shifts that you see uh, depicted here just go line by line, right? From being something very technical to something that is really a site of science, policy science practice engagement, something that was focused very much on, on nicely bounded problems that you know, we thought we could hand over to technology experts, and now increasingly it's focused on complex, global, interconnected systemic risks. Um, from the more positivist approaches to understanding that we actually all make up what the risk is in our minds, um, rationalist to psychometric and cultural approaches, you can read it all here. The, the point is, um, I think we've seen a big shift over the career that Roger was participating in, and I think he helped very much in that particular transition to help us increasingly, and in his own interest, right, going from um, say, nuclear energy, which is by no means a simplistic and nicely bounded one, but try global change, right? It's, it's vastly uh, bigger in scope and uh, in what is involved and who needs to be at the table, which places the initial risk science, if you will, in that corner. And all of you who have taken classes by Roger know he loved this graphic. <laughs> Everyone had to go through Funtovitz and Rabbits at one point or another. And he, in his own career, and all of us, have moved with him to the place of dealing with wicked problems, right? That is really where, in, in this last book um, that he uh, edited, but also where many of us have moved to, to dealing with these very value-driven, very hard to define, indeterminate problems um, that we need to grapple with. And I think in one picture, this to me would be, where is the future of risk and hazard studies? It is not in the corner. It is in that wider arena um, of, of uh, our work. Here's the kinds of questions that we ask in that book. And um, many of the chapters begin to address some of that. One is that question about who gets to say what's most important, right? How do we prioritize that? And that is, among other things, questions about should we focus on the things that affect us right here now or that will be affecting generations to come? 
how do we address that? How do we account for those future perspectives? Um, in they, they are not here at the table, right? So who gets to say? Um, how do we account for spatial interconnectivity? So just as an example, a flood happens, I don't know, somewhere in, in Bangladesh. And you know, a few weeks later, the global economy had $47 billion in damages. Why? Because there was an impact on a microchip producing factory. And all the workers affected in that area who couldn't come to work, shut down of the global chip production in a way that affected the entire global economy, right? So are we thinking about those issues when we say, oh, we need to do flood protection in one area? Those are the kinds of questions. Another question, of course, is how do we make any of these assessments or decisions when uncertainty, ignorance, and indeterminacy really dominate the equation? How do we do that? What then drives our decisions? Right? Those are the kinds of questions we raise in that book. How do we communicate it? Um, already, you already raised that, so I don't need to, to belabor it, but how do we do that in an information overload, trust deficit, or a fake news world? Really, really tricky question. Um, or how do we get, um, and this is, I think, what ultimately drove Roger, is to really get at the more radical, the root of the problem, right? How do we actually address issues at that level and change vulnerability patterns more fundamentally. So those are the kinds of questions that that book asked. And one of the questions, I'm really sorry I didn't get to talk with him more about, is another conundrum. And this is this. So we need increasingly fast answers to these kinds of problems. You already began to, both of you began to echo this. and. What every scientist will tell you all is we need more time to figure it out because it's so hard. <laughs> what does that leave us with? That leaves us, I believe, with the risk of science becoming completely irrelevant and decisions being made in a sort of pre-enlightenment kind of fashion, right? Before we had science, with hunches <laughs> at best. What do we do? That's, to me, a question that we didn't ask enough about. Um, but I would have loved to have more conversation with him about that. Now, what I want to suggest to you in the second part of my talk um, is that there is this, this crux of time um, is, is really crucial to think about, and one we haven't addressed, and I think one that maybe in whatever constellation Clark might imagine for itself, might want to think about. So what we have learned is that science only gets considered in decision making, and Ed, you made a good point about that, if it is relevant, if it is credible, and legitimate. And those three um, characteristics, you know, they are somewhat at odds with each other. Um, you have to balance them off. But those are the things that we know um, that at least give it a chance of being considered. Credible, relevant, and legitimate. What is the chance of that science then to actually be used? You know, it's one thing to just say, well, that's really interesting, thank you very much, and then go on to do something else. But what actually would make it be more likely to be used? Well, if there is a shared understanding of problem and decision context, you heard many examples today of how Roger created that shared understanding. Um, when the science actually gets delivered on time, you know, <laughs> delivering it two weeks after the decision had to be made is kind of not useful. Um, if it helps people make a better decision and actually make it more efficiently. If you're asking a decision maker to, you know, why don't you go and get four years of training in how to use this complicated set of data with this totally new whatever set of software that, sorry. <laughs> They have other things to do, right? So you have to make their life easier, or else it's not going to be used. Well, and then the actual using it, what makes that more likely? What we know from science policy interaction studies is that the more scientists work with practitioners, the more the user actually has a good sense of skills and knowledge of how to use that data, what it means, what the implications are, the more they see the risks and benefits of using it, and the more they trust you, the scientist, 
the more likely they're actually going to say, okay, I'm going to push the button and use that data. Now, what does it take to build trust? What do we know about that? Roger contributed much to that. Mutual engagement, mutual you know, exchange of information and benefit in the interaction. Intentionality in terms of how we interact with each other. The actual competence of somebody <laughs> does matter. You trust them more if they know how to drive the car, you know, that kind of thing. Um, if you promise something that you follow through, and simply time. It takes time. You don't build trust just by, you know, I walked in the door and here you have it, even if you do the other things. So that puts time at the center of the question of how do we engage with each other. You all know this African proverb, if you want to go fast, go alone. If you want to go far, <coughs> go together. And inherent in that um, proverb, I think, is why it is so tricky to build trust and to build that relationship that we just talked about. So let me ask first how we can go faster if we each, on the science side and on the practitioner side, how we could speed that up. So if you think of this as the quo vadis of science practice interaction, um, and I put risk in, in parentheses because I think this is true for sustainability science more broadly or any kind of engaged science. On the science side, ways to speed up delivery of usable science, and then on the decision side, and also in between, what can we do on each one? On the science side, I think what we could do to speed things up is to actually have more sites um, where we monitor what's happening in the global environment, in the social environment, that would be great. Um, we know how difficult that is to actually uh, get funded. Rapid risk assessment methodologies, there are some out there, Mostly they're not used. Machine learning, big data might you know, actually help us in this, uh, in this regard. Partnerships and collaborations, first it takes time to establish them, but once you have them, it's actually really helpful. It goes a lot faster next time. So don't just use every single time a new site to do your research. Stay with it, right? Build your relationships, have continuity in those places. Actually embedding decision makers in the work that you do as a scientist. Like what if there's fellowships, right? Imagine that um, Clark not only trains students but actually has decision makers who live here for a while and say, you know what, this is how it works in our world. Um, and then scaling up the training and capacity of building for transdisciplinary work. Yesterday there were questions in the audience about uh, does Clark, um, support people adequately in you know, being prepared to work in, in the world of practice. Well, this is a long conversation, we could have that. I, I believe you do, but you could do it more effectively. Oh, go. I gotta rush here. Okay, on, this, on the uh, decision-making side, there's a lot that could be uh, done. I, I'm not gonna go through it in the interest of time. Sorry, it's cut off on the one, one hand. And then there's work actually in the middle between the two boundary organizations and boundary individuals who have fluency in both, um, both realms, and that needs training as well. So another area in which Clark could become a lot better. So then that just comes, you know, the question, what if you need to go far and fast? In other words, you need to work together and do all these other things. What are our options? Um, well, since you already have seen the slides, I'm not gonna um, belabor this. Um, otherwise, I would give you the riddle of what model we have for it. And I think this is the model we have in nature for how to go far and fast. Now, what does that mean in terms of who we need? At the very front of this, we need not scientists. We need decision coaches, people who can help make difficult decisions, generalists supporting these decision makers, and really skilled communication and engagement people. Behind them, youth-inspired researchers, people who synthesize, who pull the stuff together, that is all over the place, right? And maybe chat GPT is helping us with that now. I'll say that with, with a big deep breath. <coughs> Boundary organizations, decision scientists, yes. Those are the kinds of people we need behind them. And behind that, we need the applied researchers, the open science ad advocates, the innovation research, the big science and fundamental researchers. So we need all of them, but we need to align them. So in summary, because I don't have any time left. Um, a Caspersonian call to think and act. I think there are lots of the right geese out there, but they're not aligned 
in a flock. And I think in this day and age, that to me feels like a kind of modern day heresy. You know, if you want to be part of this conversation of dealing with risk conundrums, I think you have to find an effective place in the flock and actually work with others who are in, in your vicinity, who, who can help you become more effective and your flapping of the winds help someone else be more effective. So I'll close with simply saying, what is a risk conundrum? It comes from the Latin conundrum, a thing that is to be attempted. And in other words, there are no bystanders in this world of risk analysis and risk assessment. All right, so we have about four minutes, and I've been told that I have to be on time because uh, cause lunch is following, so, so maybe we can stretch it by a minute or two. But questions, comments? Hi, Alice Cook. I'm Tom Webler, graduated in 92. Um, for Tony and Ed, I'm really interested in what you think about models, because NSF puts so much money into models, integrated assessment models, energy transition, modeling the transitions. Are these being used in the agencies you guys work with, and is that a path forward for Clark? I can first, but I don't have a lot to say, so it won't help me. Um, in Ford, absolutely not. Talk about the sort of speed and those, those sorts of issues that, that Susie was raising are real. Um, but in a bunch of our partners, yes. So I'm thinking of one partner, the Africa Climate Foundation, which is increasingly playing an important role in kind of mediating discussions about just energy transition partnerships through, through Africa at least, but I think it's going to their wings are going to spread further, I suspect. Um, there is modeling work that they are drawing on and that they are, they're using, partly developing and drawing upon. So that's just as one example, a pretty high-end example. Um, so I think models are used. Um, not, well, I'll stop there. Let Ed go next. I could say more. And then maybe I'll play off that by in a cautionary note, because I, I do agree with Tony, I think they are used, but, and I can't speak, I, I, I don't speak for every federal agency or anything like that, like my experience is where it is. But a concern I have with models is that within the agencies I've worked closely with, there are not necessarily a lot of people who understand those models well, could run them, and the model can turn into the magic feather that lets you fly. No one actually knows how the magic feather works, they just know it helps you fly. And like the model coughs up something, well, it was a model. It was done by someone that people, so clearly like the output must be good. And then it actually can hold off some of the critical questioning that everybody was just talking about. So I'm not gonna, I don't think it always happens, but I think there's a real danger in that. We say the word model, either it gets completely rejected, right, because it's a model, so it's not real, right? That's what people argue it's climate, or it's a model run by scientists, therefore it's an output that must be valid. And there's a weird kind of bimodality that happens there sometimes that worries me. Hi, thanks to everybody for your uh, presentation and talks. This has been very informative. My name is Mike Athe. I'm a current PhD student in the Graduate School of Geography. Um, I was just wondering if the panelists wouldn't mind commenting on um, j just some thoughts around the alignment between the incentives in uh, academic institutions and then some of the calls for more engaged scholarship that you are um, alluding to. Uh, in particular, I'm thinking about the currency of, I don't know, academic progress being tied to publication, and uh, I don't know, I'm encountering that in my own work a little bit about, I feel like I've had to strip the more um, connected, community, engaging parts of my research away, <laughs> and maybe more collaborative and, I don't know, community outreach, considering more points of view, in favor of trying to progress in my I don't know, like degree and get things finished. And so I'm just, I don't know, at all levels, that's me at my level where I'm at, at all levels, if, uh, you know, like how, how do we think about the incentives between, or the relationship between the incentives of academia and the currency of academia and then doing more 
applied research. Thanks. So as the person who is not in academia, I'm happy to speak to that. Um, <laughs> um, so I would say one of the responsibilities of those of us who have gone before you is to um, help change the culture that still adheres to that, um, that still requires those kinds of things, um, given how little any of you, and I mean all of us, read still, um, and how little how difficult it is to get published, um, how challenging it is to get peer review, how ridiculous peer review often is. Um, I'm sorry to be so blunt, but I guess that's my experience. Um, I would just say we have to really think much more fundamentally about whether or not that is a good measure of academic standing um, or whether we need something very different. And I think the only people to really make that change is those of us who are in positions of power to influence how you know, professional societies, uh, academic journals, and, and departments do that. So I'm not in that position, but um, I can tell you from out here, one can survive and be an, a good thinker and intellectual um, and have lots of publications and not you know, uh, need the sort of academic approval um, that comes with tenure. Two, two very quick things uh, from experience. Um, one of them is I was actually incredibly lucky to land where I did in my first tenure line job because uh, at the University of South Carolina, we had a lot of faculty, including Kirsten, who were doing engaged work and that created a space for that kind of work inside that department where that was not pushed away to one side. And I just was lucky in the sense that that's where I ended up. The only second point I'll say is that's something I'm particularly proud of that we've done over an IDCE is actually explicitly talk about count, account for that engaged work in our promotion and tenure guidelines to make sure that, that stuff is valued. Now, one big, big caveat on that is that's great, you can advance here. I, I, there are still questions in the larger discipline. Like, we will count it here for sure, but if you want to move on in your career, would that be counted? I, I think there are still much larger structural questions. I was just going to say something like that. So, yeah. <laughs> well, with that, I think, I think we probably have to wrap it up. Um, for those of you who, are, who have registered for the lunch, that is, I believe, upstairs in Tilton, so I've been asked to, to, to ask you to, to make your way there. And with that, let's please thank our panelists.